everybody. Uh, thank you for joining and welcome. Uh, the talk today, we'll be talking about what are the key unanswered questions that physicists are chasing today. The goal of the discussion is also to cover the current state of physics, our understanding of our universe, the gaps in our understanding, uh, as well as covering physics education. Uh, we will also talk about the mission and the goals of the American Institute of Physics as it approaches its 100 year anniversary in the year 2031. With that, I would like to welcome Michael Maloney, who is currently the ninth CEO of the American Institute of Physics, a federation that advances the success of its 10 member societies. Currently, Maloney is also a corresponding member of the International Academy of Astronautics an associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautic and Astronautics, a fellow of the American Physical Society, and a fellow of the in Institute of Physics. He is a member of the board of directors of the Center for the Advancements of Science in Space. He also sits on the Science Technology Assessment and Analytics Inaugural Polaris Council at the US Government Accountability Office. Maloney is a recipient of the Distinguished Service Award from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Prior to joining AIP, Maloney was a director of, for space and aeronautics at the US National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine for more than 15 years. He holds a PhD in experimental physics. With that, let's welcome Michael. Hi, Sandeep. Great to see you. I'm sorry it's not in three dimensions, but we'll we'll persist with two for as long as we have to. But thanks so much to you and the team for this invitation and the chance to talk to members of the Google team. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Michael. And the honor is ours. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Um, so at first, I thought maybe we get to know the person, Michael, the story of Michael. Uh, you did your schooling back in Ireland uh, all the way until your PhD. Uh, going back to your early education days, if you can share with us, what got you interested in science, uh, specifically in physics, uh, and go as far back as perhaps your elementary school days, and also share with us who were your role models growing up? So I, I was reflecting on this. I mentioned this to you earlier. I was reflecting on this uh, last, last evening, and... Um, the first, I guess the first role model I should probably mention is actually my mother, who really inspired all of us as a family to uh, follow wherever our interests led us. And, and I think she recognized in me early on that I had a curiosity about thing, how things worked and about science and such. So she was, uh, and I'm so lucky to have both my parents still with us, but she, for 40 years, she ran a preschool uh, for two and a half to five years old. And I was in her first inaugural class a long time ago. And, um, you know, I think she really, um, through play, allowed us to really think about um, what interests us, even at that very young age. So my first one of the first memories, though, that I have of sort of interacting with science, per se, or even science and engineering, and I guess I was probably around three or four years old. Uh, we lived in a part of Dublin, which is probably about a quarter of a mile from the US Embassy. And uh, she took me by the hand and led me down the street to go visit the US Embassy and, and see the uh, a, 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 a moon rock that had been brought back by one of the Apollo programs and um, missions and I just I was just literally blown away by that experience of standing in front of a piece of the moon and apparently my mother tells me that all the way back up to the house I was going on about you know I wanted to be I wanted to be an astronaut and I wanted to go into space you know typical three four year old kid stuff but I think that just indicated that the even at the earliest age, whereas I might not have made it to space, there was that that curiosity there. And then the other part that I think was thinking about last night was the role of teachers. Sure, my parents were my first teachers, but I'm thinking back to our school systems a little bit differently organized um, than here in the US, but it's sort of the equivalent of high school, middle school and high school. Um, 
uh, I really began to focus in on the sciences, uh, even at that stage. And I had a fantastic uh, physics and math teacher. And uh, I think you know, because you and I have talked about this previously, the importance of good teachers and being surrounded by good teachers. And he, he really encouraged me and in what we now would call physics identity. He, even at that early stage, I think he helped me understand that I, I had not just an aptitude, but an, you know, a real passion for doing the sciences. And so he really did encourage me through, through school. But then you know, I could keep going on because there was a bunch of other things I used to do. I got involved when I was about 13 and in an organization that ran the what was called the Irish Youth Science Week. It was sort of like a week-long science camp and helped found the, the, uh, the Irish Youth Science groups um, with the, my friend Patrick. You know, we were 17. We didn't know we weren't supposed to do that kind of thing when we were 17, I guess. And so we just did it. And it was a lot of fun. And the fun and the science were all mixed up together, which really, again, encouraged me. And then two other things I'd say is television. <laughs> You know, growing up in Ireland in the in the seventies and into the early eighties, we were still pretty isolated in Ireland from the rest of the world. It's not the global economy that it is today; it's really transformed. So, having access to people like Carl Sagan, I, I distinctly remember watching Cosmos and and really being inspired by the wonder of the universe uh, through his words, because he was a fantastic storyteller. And then also had the privilege, um, because they rebroadcast some BBC content on Irish television, to get engaged with um, some of the, what they call the Christmas lectures, which came from the Royal Institution in London. So those are just some of the things that led me to, to my science background. And I think just, uh, cultivated, I guess, the the sort of innate interest that I had. Thank you, Michael. Um, my wife's also a preschool teacher, by the way, and so I can relate to teachers having an impact from a very early age. Um, and the Carl Sagan quote, pale blue dot, is one of my favorite. It sits it's, in my house. Oh, yeah, it's just extraordinary. When you think back to what, what he, he was able to do, um, uh, you know, decades ago about and, and to tell the story of discovery in a way that was so accessible um, uh, in a time when we didn't have the internet, when we didn't have um, the, the hundreds of channels that we have today. He really was a fantastic storyteller. Yep, definitely. Michael, thank you. Um, switching to the work you're doing at AIP now, um, if you can share for folks who are not fully aware, what is the American Institute of Physics? Um, what motivated you to join uh, them? And kind of what are, if you can share the near and long term goals of AIP as it approaches its 100 year anniversary in a decade or so? So, yeah, AIP, we're, we're um, a little bit different to some of the other nonprofit organizations, if you will, in the physical sciences or the science space. Uh, in that we don't have individual members at AIP, um, but we're an organization of, of organizations that have individual members throughout the science, the, throughout the physical sciences community. So if you go back to our, our founding back in 1931, it was in the midst of the depression, and there was a realization that some of the still relatively young but important societies that were representing and convening the scientific communities, community in physics were under a lot of financial stress, as were their journal productions. The, the journals, as, as many of the folks on the, on, the, on the video today will know, scientific journals are, along with conferences, are the primary way that scientists share information and share discovery and build collaborations. But in the, in the midst of the, the Great Depression, those were under severe financial strain. And whereas we're nonprofit organizations, we're still subject to the same puts and takes and pressures that any other business is. Uh, and so AIP was established with a grant from the Chemical Foundation um, and five original member societies, really to get economies of scale in the, in the journal publishing business. Um, fast forward, 
uh, to today, and we have 10 member societies that in turn represent just under 120,000 members uh, who are physicists, engineers, teachers, students, um, and such, medical practitioners, um, really a very broad, diverse community of, of, of scientists. Um, and we have 27 affiliate societies that broaden our scientific scope and reach even further. We own AIP Publishing, which was spun off, our pub journal publishing business was spun off about eight years ago. Um, but that still is a very important revenue source for AIP to fund the work that we do. And you made mention of this when, when you were doing your very kind introduction of me, which made me blush because of all those ridiculous acronyms. But, but um, uh, we, uh, you made mention of um, the, the fact that we're, we have sort of two tracks to our, our, our strategy, our identity, if you will, at the moment, which is one as a federation of, of member societies that really tries to advance their success. So what are the priority areas that are, you know, are important to our societies like the American Physical Society or the Optical Society or the Society of Rheology or the American Association of Physicists and Medicine, the, the, the list goes on. What are their priorities and how can we help them succeed? And then also, how can we drive um, success and, uh, and advance the frontiers of the physical sciences enterprise, not through scientific research per se, but through the application of, for instance, our expertise on data science and survey science. We have in-house social scientists whose work is really focused on, on our community and, and the way we do science. Uh, we have a policy newsletter called FYI, um, that tries to inform the community about what's going on in the world of policy. And we have Physics Today, which is the flagship magazine of the Federation that um, reports on the, the cutting edge uh, science in, in, our, in our fields. And the, and the list goes on. So we, we are, we are we, it's often easy to get confused about what AIP is, um, because sometimes we're known better for the things we do than who we are as, as an organization. But it's, uh, it's a really critical element in my mind to the future of, the, of physics and the physical sciences. So I think one of the things we've been trying to do over the last, I've been trying to do since I joined three years ago, is really to pull out some of those key issues of identity and scope and mission and so we adopted a new strategic framework um, a few, uh, three years ago, uh, two years ago now, that's really driving a transformation because, and this will be familiar to many of, of, of your community too, we came to the realization that we are essentially a content organization rather than an organization of disparate programs and products and services. So we're really reorienting the what we do to be a content organization that, that um, supports our mission and supports the missions of our members. And so it's an exciting future that we have as we really begin to think about uh, the future of that data and audience analytics and content and production and dissemination really means for our future. So we, we may be a little bit different than when we started in the building that's behind me in the Flatiron Building in New York City back in 90 years ago. but. Um, I'm really excited about the future that we have. Thank you, Michael. Um, so while we linger on the topic of scientific institutions, it seems like there is a lot of interest in the US Congress currently uh, in expanding federal funding for R&D in emerging technologies area. For example, the Senate passed a legislation that proposes to greatly expand the NSF, National Found, uh, Science Foundation, through a new technology directorate. Just wanted to get your take on, are you closely following that? And um, how, how do you unpack all that that's happening in that space? Uh, um, yes, we certainly are. And um, uh, that's been one of the major efforts of our FYI reporting team. Um, it may only be a team of four, but um, they're doing a fantastic, amazing work on following these kinds of major policy directions in tremendous detail. So if anyone's interested, just Google AIP and FYI and you will, uh, you'll find us pretty quickly. So it's, you know, I, 
I was actually just talking about this with some colleagues yesterday morning. One of the real privileges I have is co-chairing an ad hoc group of CEOs like myself from uh, nearly 80 societies across the sciences, medical sciences, social sciences, and we were talking about this legislation just yesterday. And really, there's a while, while many of us may have some concerns about certain aspects of the legislation that's in the in the Senate or in the in the House, where there's absolute consensus is that it's a remarkable time for us right now, as we begin hopefully to emerge from this pandemic, that the sciences have received such tremendously strong support from very senior leaders, both in the administration, in the Congress, and in the in the Senate and, and in the in the House of Representatives. And it's a, a level of interest and a willingness to support the sciences and, and research in, in a way that we probably haven't seen for some decades. That's tremendously exciting to see. And it reminded me as I was thinking about this again last night and thinking about today, and, and thinking you might ask about this, uh, I was reminded that early on in the pandemic, one of the things we like to do at AIP is around convening. So convening members of our community to think about some of the challenges and opportunities that we have as the physical sciences enterprise. And so um, uh, in April last year, we convened a small team of uh, some very leading um, scientists and engineers, um, some of whom you know, Sandeep, um, to think about the impact of, of the pandemic on the physical sciences. And, and this was an experiment for us to sort of put out a very fast track report to try to help the community about how the pandemic was, was impacting the way we do our science and, and the scientists who, who, do, who do our science. One of the things they, they mentioned in their report that was called uh, Peril and Promise because the, the task force, the committee could see that there were both opportunities, but also uh, potential risks in, in how the pandemic might impact the future of the physical sciences. They wondered out loud that you could imagine that maybe there would be a overwhelming focus on an understandable focus and welcome focus on, continue focus on the medical sciences and the biomedical sciences. But the risk for us as a community was that somehow that would lead to a, a lesser focus on on the physical sciences. So to see ideas emerge, such as um, um, you know, uh, ARPA-C on climate, uh, a new directorate at, at NSF focused on technology or what the House is suggesting focused on society challenges and the Congress will figure out how to design that eventually. Um, to look at the support that's going on uh, now for expansion at NIST, or even today, I think it's happening right now, there's a hearing on the Hill about infrastructure at, at NASA, some of which is 60, 70 years old. I mean, JWST was tested in an enormous chamber that was actually built to test the um, Apollo capsules back in the early days of the, of the space program. It's, it's just a, a unique moment in time for us to be to be uh, subject to this uh, support from our political leaders. And I think it reflects uh, a support that uh, that's broadly in the community for, for the sciences. And so what we've been trying to do is to ensure that one, the community through our FYI knows what's going on on these particular issues and uh, can track the legislation um, in the House and the Senate so that people can make up their own minds about what they want to do. and. We also worked very closely with some sister organizations uh, to make sure in a, in a letter that we sent to the administration and to the leaders of the House and the Senate that as, as a scientific community, we welcome their attention and want to help them get to the best solutions as they think about how to build uh, an infrastructure of science and innovation and discovery and technology that can drive success for us into the into the 21st century. Thank you, Michael. Um, related to that, uh, uh, it might have been your experience during the pandemic. It was my experience that uh, trust in 
scientific work, uh, scientific institutions, scientists uh, took a toll. Um, I can also think of the experience of climate scientists, for example. Um, so what do you think scientific institutions like AIP can do uh, to win back uh, the place of uh, trust that scientists perhaps deserve and scientific institutions as well? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important question for us to understand how best to uh, ensure that we're representing our science, uh, communicating it out to the to uh, all of our stakeholders in, in the general public and elsewhere, in industry, in, in political circles, et cetera. And that we're also uh, ensuring that we are building a community that is based on um, ethics and diversity and, and, uh, uh, and respect for institutions and such. And so that's part of what we try to do at AIP. But you know, I, um, you gave me a heads up that we might be talking about trust in science, and so I do. I, yesterday evening, I, I do what I normally do when I want to find out what's actually going on, and I look for some data. Um, and I, I apologize if I um, glance at some notes here while I'm talking with you, Sandy, but I wanted to make sure I got it right. So one of the one of the organizations that I turn to is is one that's called Science Counts which is a small and nonprofit organization that since 2015 is relatively new, if you will, but uh, supported by a number of, 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 prof, of um, foundations. Uh, Science Count have been doing very detailed survey work and really understanding the dynamics of the, of the um, perceptions of science in, in the broader public community. Um, and it's interesting in that whereas um, they found some interesting aspects of how COVID has impacted uh, those data. Um, and, and some of the changes have been quite significant. And one of the things they noted in their most recent report that's only a couple of months old is that while they've been doing their work, there's been fairly consistent public support for some of the, um, uh, the, the for the se or, or sense of urgency around some of the uh, science frontiers that we might know of, like um, the environment or climate or disease and such. But COVID has changed some of those attitudes. And uh, looking at the data here now, um, they noted that one thing that has, has the num some of the numbers that have come down are the percentage of respondents in their latest survey who say that scientific research needs to focus on non-COVID diseases. So some of the actions around opioid addiction, water, food and water safety and such, and a few other areas have actually um, dropped in their support, if you will. But what's increased in quite a significant way was uh, the need for scientific research to focus on economic growth. That increased by 25% in the course of about a year. And that's uh, pretty, they also do, uh, pretty good analysis of, of segments of the community and how that how these um, numbers change in segments of the community. Um, and so that was a pretty, but that was a pretty consistent, consistent number that that uh, consistent increase in, in the data. But then probably more pertinent to your question is, is Americans trust in science. And in fact, um, in 2020, although I don't think this is widely known in the community, According to this survey, anyway, there was a 10% increase in the, in the trust in scientists over the course of 2020, which stands in departure from a slight decline which Science Counts had, had measured in between 2015 and 2019. So it'll be interesting to know what some of the dynamics are about that, but clearly, again, it seems obvious that COVID has been... Has been uh, uh, an impactor in there. And they, they also then delve deeper into it, which may be of interest to the team watching as well, which is, um, you know, the public trusts in science, scientists to act in society's best interests. That went up but from to 73% from 69%. Um, the, the confidence to put uh, personal politics aside by scientists went up from, from 52 to 63%. Um, and so 
there, there seems to be this movement within the community at the moment that has been positive for the scientific community that maybe hasn't shown up in some of the other survey data yet. But I think um, science can, tends to have their finger on the pulse in a way um, and with a granularity that can be really helpful. So I really, if, if any, of, any of the folks uh, listening today are interested um, you can just find their, all of their work online. And, and, uh, and for any of the data geeks out there, the charts are all there showing the general trends in the different segments and such. So I think our work really now is to ensure that those kind of data are understood by our community as well. So that sometimes, frankly, sometimes myths can ev evolve over time. Um, and I think one of the roles here that we can have at AIP is is to ensure that our community does understand these kinds of trends uh, in public perceptions. And also one of the conversations we've had is how can we connect scientists um, to organizations that are helping scientists communicate better because as scientists, we're often not very good at doing that. And we sometimes think we know uh, how to move the needle on on public opinion, uh, and at the most crass level, that usually becomes something like, "Well, only if they if they only knew how important my work was, then they would support it." And we know from social science and human science work that that kind of approach never works. Um, and so we can only hope to continue the trends and underpin the trend that we the science can data show us for support in science by making sure that we are speaking to people's day-to-day -day experiences and their day-to-day -day needs. So for the farmer, what can science and engineering do to help them um, uh, get the most out of their land and produce the best crops and such and ensure that they have a water supply and, and such. And telling those stories is really, really important, which again sort of cycles back to what we were saying about Carl Sagan and, and the importance of, of telling stories about science Yeah, thank you, Michael. And maybe we switch to another challenge that uh, the physical sciences have been having, which is uh, getting uh, representation from uh, underrepresented minority groups in the physical sciences. Um, can you tell us um, uh, what AIP has done to understand the root cause of this issue? And also, what is your what is our best understanding on why underrepresented minority groups are not choosing to go into these fields of study. This is such an important topic, Sandeep, and thank you for raising it. And I don't think there's a meeting I go to at the moment where the importance of what we call at AIP, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and accessibility, uh, DEBA for short, um, I don't think there's a meeting that I that I go to at the moment where we are not talking about this as a community. So there is a tremendously um, expand expansive view, I think, growing within our, our our physical sciences community about the importance of this topic. And and to to um, focus on us a little bit at AIP first, I think one of the aspects of our work I'm most proud of is in and around. Uh, the work we've done to build a, 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 a more scientific understanding of some of the dynamics within our community that lead to um, some of the challenges we have about representation and belonging in our community. And so I'll get specific now. One aspect that we have been focused on, and it's only one of many, many, many tracks and pillars of diversity that are important to our community, but one of our internal advisory committees a few years ago pointed to the, uh, the data that we have and we've been gathering at AIP for decades now. And back in the mid 1940s, we established a, a statistical research center that for year on year has been measuring the makeup of our community in physics and astronomy at a detail and in a, in a, in a in a comprehensive way that few other communities have for that length of time. And they pointed to the fact that whereas the number of physics and astronomy graduates 
had doubled or so in about 10 years, up to about 9,000 a year. And whereas uh, there were improving numbers, if you will, for instance, around gender balance and stuff within our community, even though we still got a lot of work to do there. And indeed, although um, severely underrepresented, some minority groups were tracking, if you will, the overall increase in the physics graduate numbers of graduates of physics. One number was shocking to our to that committee. And then when they highlighted it to the community more broadly, which is the number of African Americans in our in our graduating bachelor's classes has flatlined at best for decades and is hovers between three and four percent of the number of graduates. And, and indeed, um, as a as a fraction, it's probably close to decreasing over time. So we are notwithstanding years of very um, uh, well uh, thought out efforts by our community, we have failed. I'm going to be pretty stark about this. We have failed as a community to really support our African American students as they work their way through the four years bachelor's degree. And so we focused very much on that. And there, there are lots of other challenges about around um, uh, the representation of, of African Americans in our community. I mean, there are shocking numbers at the K through 12 level also, where only 25% of African American high school students um, uh, take physics or 30% of Latinx students take physics. Um, and sometimes that's because physics isn't necessarily available to them. Sometimes it's about an identity issue. So we took the approach of, yes, that's a really important problem, but we wanted to understand the, the dynamics around uh, retention in particular and the sense of belonging in particular in physics and astronomy undergraduate classes. So we engaged a, a task force of social scientists to work with some leading uh, pedagogical uh, experts and and some folks uh, from the from the from the physics science community that are uh, were already dedicated to this work to really do a two year study to give a deep dive to understand this dynamic within our community. That report came out. It's called Team Up. The Team Up report came out in January of 2020, just before we all disappeared into the pandemic. But it really, it's, it, I'd commend it to any of you interested in, there's an executive summary that, that's pretty, pretty um, short and accessible. But it really, the research that we did by both gathering survey data and also focused interviews with, with um, students and former students was we built up this picture of what the lived experience of a, of a black student in physics and astronomy departments is. And it pointed to some considerable changes we need to make in the culture of physics, uh, in the being very intentional about ensuring that every individual student who, who enters as a freshman into a, into a track that could lead to a, a physics degree and their interest in physics, that they feel supported, that they have the ability to build um, what what the the um, the researchers in physics education will call the physics identity, that they can see themselves as being a physicist in the future, and that there's a future for them in employment, for instance, that speaks to their interests and needs. And so, um, and that isn't always necessarily in, in research or PhD level research even, but it can be often about societal impact um, for the student population that exists today. So we're very, very much focused on this at the moment. As you know, Sandeep, from your role here at AIP, where we've, we've launched a, a foundation, AIP foundation, to help us drive partnership with supporting philanthropic um, partners um, to build out a program that um, will address these issues around cultural change, about a sense of belonging, and in particular about focusing on African American student needs. The one final thing, and then, then you may have some questions or want to talk about it more, but the other element that I, 
I should have known about, but I have to admit, I did not know until the report came out, and and I, I'm I'm ashamed I did not know this piece of data. But the impact of the fact that that African American families have one tenth of the family wealth um, of white families in this country, that is one of the reasons that has a distinct impact on retention of African American students in our bachelor's class. We're not talking about a huge number. Our, our goal is to double the number of African Americans in 10 years who are graduating. That would bring it from about 250 to 500. These are not big numbers, but that will, I think, change the experience for all of the students as it becomes much more inclusive. And so I hope you can sense I'm really passionate about this because I think this is where we have as an organization, and we're a relatively small organization at AIP, but a, we're, we've decided to be laser focused on this one aspect of, of, of the tremendous DBA challenges that we have across our community because we think we can move the needle and we can get to that doubling number. And in doing so, really change, help change and support the, uh, the changes in culture, in the physics culture, which um, our, many of our member societies are also engaged in trying to change. Michael, I'd like to commend the work of AIP in this space. Um, and I should mention that uh, this problem is not unique to physics or the physical sciences. Uh, the underrepresented minority groups and the representation in computer science, mathematics, or pretty much every field of engineering um, remains an issue. Uh, perhaps a sub-question on that, Michael, um, we have some listeners, several listeners from Google here. What can tech companies like Google or others uh, do to help in the in your mission in this field? You know, I think one of the one of the um, things that can be done is to think about. I, I really focus on like local engagement as well. With um, where you know, Google is one of these companies that's everywhere. <laughs> I was in New York City yesterday. You're there. I'm from Dublin, as you as 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 you know. You mentioned Google's very big there, uh, out there in California. You're you know these company th these large tech companies. You're everywhere, both virtually and physically. Reaching out to, um, uh, in particular, under resourced educational or um, uh, communities is really important. So for a number of reasons, um, to show the diversity of futures that our physics and astronomy students can have. Um, uh, because we know from our research as well through the team of project that um, many minoritized students are, are not necessarily as motivated by say the the traditional physics culture idea of wanting to, you know, I'm going to do my bachelor's, then I might do a master's, but then I'll do my PhD, and then I want to be a research scientist. That that that, that is an important track, but it doesn't speak uh, to many people, and in fact, it doesn't reflect. We know from our data gathering where actually physicists and astronomers go. So telling that story about the potential future and how. Uh, how students can meet their interests in 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 reaching reaching and changing societies and technology and and such, I think is a really important. And then also to be a little self-serving, um, this I've got to say is a tremendous opportunity um, that that Google is providing to me to 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 highlight some of these issues that are important to us to just make people aware of them. Um, this is something where we're dedicated to trying to change and where we can find a community of support, um, uh, I think will be important. So a lot of technology companies as, as, and a lot of other companies as we think through the social impact of, 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 of even private philanthropy support by individuals or by corporations, um, I think those are all things that are growing in our community, which is really welcome. And so um, I would just urge everyone just to think about their local high school, their local community college, for every manager in a, in a facility to think, is there a HBCU 
uh, nearby that we can go and 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 support or a minority serving institution how can we get involved with the community to really help this uh, focus on identity and a focus on the future that these students can have in physics and astronomy and other technical technical degrees does that help sandeep yes definitely thanks michael um next we'll pivot a little bit towards um uh, trying to get your take on some of the key unanswered questions on physics uh, in physics. And we have a whole list of them. I'll try to get through <laughs> as many as, as I can. Um, I, I do admit these are not easy questions, uh, but would love to. And don't forget, I haven't actually done physics for 30 years. But anyway, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you taking them. Um, the first one is, after all this time, we still have very big unanswered questions about mass. Uh, turns out still substantial fraction of the universe is still unknown uh, and we call it dark matter or dark energy. Um, what is our current state of understanding of this dark matter and who are some of the leading experts in this field trying to unpack this mystery for us? You know, I, I think if ever there was a, a story, getting back to storytelling again, if ever there was a story that that has the potential to really um, inspire people. It's the it's the the story of the dark universe. I mean, I I think back to even when I was in 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 doing my bachelor's degree in the in the mid eighties. Um, certainly, we knew about you know the Big Bang and and we knew the universe was expanding, but we didn't know what the and we you know we still don't know, ultimately know what the future of the universe is. But gosh. We didn't really fully appreciate how much we didn't know, and and to think about the fact that when we look at in, when we look up in the sky through a telescope or with our eyes or some of the the most um, uh, um, technologically advanced telescopes and such, and we we count up everything we can see, we're only going to see five percent of the universe all the stars, all the galaxies, all the planets, all the gas between the stars, all of that, everything we can see, we now know makes up 4.9% of the universe. The rest um, is about 68% of something we call dark energy and 27% of something that we call dark matter. And it's really interesting, again, to think about the trajectory of the story of these discoveries and you know some of the earliest work that was done by people like Vera Rubin um, who is a fantastic astronomer and and if anybody's interested in knowing more about her we have a, a transcript of an oral history in our Center for History of Physics along with many other folks too but it's a fascinating reading the work that she did on understanding the dynamics of how galaxies spin um, and and the dynamics of 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 how the uh, galaxies and such are, are moving away from each other um, or work that Adam Reese and his team did to look at uh, s s1a supernovas and to understand what wow not only are we all not only is every galaxy moving away from each other but it's a move the rate at which they're moving away from each other is increasing. I mean, it just blows your mind to think something is pushing everything, everything away from each other, <laughs> counteracting gravity in a way that, you know, Einstein thought that, that the, the universe was static. So, you know, not to get too technical, but he developed this idea of the cons um, cosmological constant, which he never liked as a concept, but he needed it to balance his equations into a static universe to counteract gravity. Um, then, then Hubble found that in fact the universe was expanding. So Einstein thought he was wrong. Now we know there's something, an energy force that's actually pushing everything away from each other. And again, that's the cosmological constant. So actually, maybe Einstein was right. We don't know yet exactly what it is. So it's it's really interesting this whole area of dark matter, dark energy. There's 
a tremendous set of very robust um, theories that are being built to try to understand uh, what those two constituents of the universe are that everything that make up 95 percent of of the universe um, there's too much to go into in in the time we have to think about all the work that's being done but to one of the, some of the things that I know well from my work at the National Academies are are some of the more um, space-based uh, future experiments that are being uh, um, developed. And one of those, so, uh, that project that used to be called W First, but is now called Vera Rubin Telescope, is going to be a key part of, of our understanding. The James Webb Space Telescope, when it launches later this year, just past launch review, again, will give us insights into, I mean, it's phenomenal what James Webb will be able to do. They'll It'll be able to peer back in the infrared, right back to the earliest galaxies, some potentially even the first stars that came out of what's called the dark ages by the astronomers, that period after the Big Bang where the, the universe was opaque. JWST will be able to look back and help us understand the dynamics of how the early universe was, was moving because we postulate that the dark energy then was significantly lower than it is now. So we'll be able to hopefully understand how it's changed over the eons. There's work going on at, at CERN to understand. Um, one of the things that's really fascinating about dark matter is it doesn't interact with what we call in physics electromagnetic radiation, light, heat, radio waves. So seeing it is not possible in the way that, that we normally would. So we have to infer its existence. Um, so for instance, if it's produced in collisions in a collider like at, at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, um, even though we may not be able to see it, we can make exquisite measurements to understand that something is carrying mass and momentum away from the, from the collision. And then we, that can give us clues as to what dark matter may be. Um, it's just extraordinary. What it's just it, just a tremendously exciting time in this area of research, and there's work to be done on the ground, underground, and in space in order to try to unlock this this dark mystery of the universe. Maybe we'll I'll give you one more question, and then maybe we go to uh, audience questions. Um, um, how can uh, physics help answer some of the big questions in other fields of study, uh, specifically of interest, say, medicine or artificial intelligence? Um, what, do you, what role do you think physics plays in the upcoming AI uh, revolution? And personally, do you have any concerns about this upcoming uh, revolu AI revolution and the role AI will play in our lives? Um, I'll be quick because I, I want to make sure we got some time for Q&A, but uh, on the latter part, it's not something I know a huge amount about, but I do uh, I do trust that uh, we will figure out how to handle the ethics of AI in time. Um, we need, we will, we will find and we will, we need and we will find the leadership to help us navigate this tremendously exciting future that, that AI uh, brings to humanity. So I'm not overly worried about it. And there'll be bumps along the road, no doubt. There always is with new technology. But in the end, we'll figure it out because that's what we tend to do as humans. Um, and so, uh, but if I think quickly about some of the opportunities for AI and physics, I, I mean, it seems obvious, but I'll say it anyway, um, is that there the intersection of the quantum universe with artificial intelligence seems inevitable. The quantum computing is going to be an important part of the uh, future of our computational um, uh, technologies. And so that's going to be an interesting and, and continuing area that obviously many of your colleagues know a lot more about than I do. Um, and uh, the other one you mentioned was around medicine. So we actually, one of the, one of the, um, organizations that's part of AIP is the American Association of Physicists and Medicine. Most of those uh, folks are practitioners who are interested in uh, using um, uh, what may have been uh, originally chemistry or physics 
uh, technology and diagnostic tools to actually understand the human body. Many of us have had MRIs or CAT scans and such. So that's a direct interface between physics and, and medicine. But the one that I think has been most interesting within the last year was some of the work that was done very on early on in the pandemic to apply some of the exquisite tools that we have to understand crystal structure um, and apply it to our understanding of the viruses that the, the virus that that causes COVID. Um, so um, facilities like Diamond in the UK or um, the uh, advanced photon source at Argonne National Lab and, and others really helped us unravel the protein structure of the of the virus um, within you know certainly by May and April and May and June of last year we had a real deep insight into the uh, the fundamental structure of the virus and indeed some of the more uh, cutting edge areas were actually also able because crystal crystallography without getting too technical crystallography requires that the protein you're trying to 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 understand in a virus, you can actually build a crystal of it, and then then you can do the crystallography. But there are some new techniques as well that are that are being developed that that allowed the spike protein that we all now know is so important, the spike protein on the on the virus to be understood in a, in an aqueous environment, which is more like how it is in the, in the human body, and so um, that fed directly then into the vaccine research that has been so important and will be will be so important to our future. So that's a really fast, you know, and I, again, I, I don't know a huge amount about either area, but those are some of the areas that have really stood out for me in the, in the last year or so. Thank you, Michael. Perhaps we could switch to audience questions. Gabe asks, do you think in our lifetimes, the main physical theories, general relativity, quantum mechanics will be superseded speculations well <laughs> physicists love to speculate that's basically what we do um, we speculate we form a theory and then we make predictions on the theory and then we run an experiment to try to figure out if the predictions are right so um you know it's a really interesting question uh i think there are uh you know used to get asked years ago like well is physics going to run out of questions you know, I think what we've learned, even from some of the discussions we've had about dark energy and dark matter is, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> because the more we learn, the more we find out we don't know. So with regard to some of the fundamental theories, though, the one I think that's probably most interesting right now to look at is what's called the standard model. And I don't want to get too far into it, but the standard model has worked for since the 1970s to explain um, the 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 presence and, uh, of the 17 fundamental particles of which the universe is com composed and how they interact with each other and how the forces, um, the four fundamental forces of the universe um, and describing those as well. But there are gaps in it. It doesn't particularly work well in terms of gravity. And the Higgs boson, that the discovery of, well, a CERN website would say, this discovery of a, of a signal or a particle that is consistent with the idea of the Higgs boson, because they're very careful about not saying that they discovered the Higgs boson for a number of reasons. Um, but that was the final, you know, missing gap in the, in the standard model. But there are hints um, that there may be more physics beyond the standard model. And so one of the ideas is to spill the next generation of accelerators in, in the next 30, 40 years or so that will allow us to understand, um, are there exceptions? Are there, are there, is there physics that isn't predicted by the standard model? And I think many physicists would look at that as, as along with some of the, um, um, uh, aspects of the dark universe that we were talking about as some of the most fundamental uh, elements of our theoretical understanding of the universe that 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 are still ripe for lots of investigation. So we've still got at least another 50 years of physics to go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, maybe I'll put in one more question I had, which is, you know, lately there's been a lot of interest in going to space uh, in the news, billionaires wanting to go to space. 
Um, there's also been a huge interest in humanity on the study in Mars, uh, on Mars, and um, and has I, I've seen a lot of journalism around it. Uh, just curious, as uh, folks more and more folks are going into space, what are some of the big goals, top three goals of NASA? Where is NASA in all of this? Uh, if you can share. So yeah, I mean, um, there's always a headline grabber uh, and. Uh, got to hand it to companies like SpaceX and, and, and Blue Origin and Virgin um, for how they have totally transformed um, uh, the, the industry. And along with the legacy companies, if you will, like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and, and, and others, I don't want to pick and choose winners and losers by any means, but it, it, I think we all recognize how much that has changed. And, you mentioned I'm really privileged to be able to help support NASA and its program on the space station by serving on the board of ISS National Lab. There's tremendous work to be done there. But what I'm most proud of, what I've been working on recently in the last few years has been helping NASA with its science priorities. The, the, the search for life, if we, if we really think about the impact on humanity, in my mind, that's probably one of the most important things that NASA is engaged in right now, the search for life off this planet. So whether it's the rovers on Mars or the missions that are being planned out to the icy moons uh, or the work that we're doing and be able to do with JWST on understanding exoplanets and maybe the atmospheres of exoplanets in far distant solar systems. I, I just think that has the potential really transform, pivot, disrupt our understanding of humanity and our place in the universe. And getting right back to your earliest question, Sandeep, about you know what motivated me to be a physicist and what motivates most of us to be a physicist, I think you'd probably, as a physicist, I think you'd probably recognize that it all sort of fundamentally flows down to uh, understanding the universe and our place in it. And so specifically on your question, I think the one about the search for life and the telltale signs of life past or present uh, outside of the Earth ecosystem, I just think is a fantastic opportunity for, for us to, as I said, change the way we view ourselves. Yeah, definitely, Michael. That is such an exciting field. I recently uh, heard a podcast by Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, regarding um, are we alone in the universe? And one sentence he said there that really struck me on why we've not seen life out there, though the Drake equation says we should have, uh, is that we've taken a cup of water out of the ocean and said, well, there's no whales out there. <laughs> it might even be a thimble. <laughs> um, so we are getting, we have just, a minute left wrapping up michael um first i would like to thank you for coming to google um and i would like to thank aip for the work they're doing and personally i would like to thank uh, i'm really looking forward to the work we do together as part of the aip foundation and advancing physics and physical sciences in society as a whole um, i don't know if you want to share any last thoughts no, just thank you to you and the team and to Google for giving me the opportunity to open a little window into AIP and what we're trying to do in the physical sciences. I look forward to continuing our work together. And then also any of you out there who's interested, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We're, we're here to serve our physical sciences and scientific community. So thanks for this tremendous opportunity. Thank you again and looking forward to our next meeting in 3D. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you, Michael. Have a good Bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.